The Roman Empire. Throughout history, there have been many claimants to this title, some more legitimate than others, but the end of World War II would put to rest any remaining European imperial ambitions, all of them except for one. The United Provinces of Illyria. The United Provinces of Illyria, or UPI for short, came to be because of one man's political schemes. He is now known as Emperor Titus II Augustus Caesar, but before he became the most powerful leader of the old continent, he was simply Joseph Bros Tito. During World War II, Tito was responsible for creating an anti-fascist resistance movement operating in the territory of formerly Yugoslavia. Their efforts to drive off German occupiers proved so successful Yugoslavia managed to liberate itself, largely without Soviet assistance. Following the war, Tito would become the leader of the, for now, small Balkan state. As compensation for years of occupation and hardship, Tito pushed for a small occupation zone in southern Austria while securing Istria and Friuli from Italy. With the extreme devastation brought to his homeland, Tito decided that he had to secure more resources to rebuild it bigger, better and stronger than it ever was before. This would require a lot of political maneuvering, starting with pretending to be a faithful ally of the Soviet Union to receive aid and resources from Stalin. This scheme worked even better than expected, as Stalin became intimately convinced of Tito's loyalty. To reward what he considered his newfound vassal, Stalin forced Bulgaria to become a member republic of Yugoslavia, while Tito decided to fully integrate his occupation zone into Slovenia. This new, larger Yugoslavia was more than prepared when a civil war came to rock Greece. The communists appeared to be losing until the Yugoslavs flooded the battlefield, forcing a stalemate. Following this, the Yugoslav forces would continue to set up and defend a Greek puppet regime in Thrace and Macedonia. But now, Yugoslavia was in a tough spot. Propping up and defending the communist Greeks was costing them dearly and the Yugoslav economy was suffering. At the same time, pretending to be loyal to Stalin became more difficult by the day, as Stalin continually attempted to assert full domination over what he considered a satellite state. Tito attempted to play both sides and gain favor from the Western powers, but his involvement with the war in Greece and his perceived friendship with the Soviets closed this door for now. From this position, Tito decided that it was a time for a new step for the nation. With an idea so grandiose, so extreme, so insane, it simply had to work. A new nationalist fiction, a myth like the one of Pan-Slavism and Yugoslavia before it. An older myth, tested time and time again, not restricted to just the southern Slavs. On the 5th of March 1953, Tito officially disbanded Yugoslavia, proclaiming himself to be the Emperor of Rome and the Princeps of Illyria. Tito would from that day forward be known as Titus II Augustus Caesar. Following this declaration, Tito openly denounced Stalin and informed the world that from Illyria, Rome had been reborn. In a dark backchamber of the Kremlin, Stalin was watching this news in complete shock and anger. I'm going to order an invasion of those backwards idiots tomorrow, he thought to himself. But when he tried to stand up, he felt a sharp pain in his heart and fell to the floor. The pure shock of Titus's declaration, as well as the betrayal of Tito, whom Stalin had considered a close friend, had killed the great dictator. With this, the Soviet Union fell into a period of disarray, causing Soviet influence over former Yugoslav lands to completely fall apart, meaning that Titus was free to do as he pleased to keep his nation safe and prosperous. Unbounded by the shackles of communism and led by an enlightened ruler, Illyria was well on its way to becoming a superpower. The emperor would introduce many reforms onto the administration, splitting the country into administrative provinces rather than republics based on nationality, fueling the concept of pan-Romanism rather than individual Slavic nationalism. The economy also began booming as Illyria opened up to both the West and the East as a neutral third party, while an armistice ended the direct fighting in Greece, freeing up many Illyrian resources. Next up came surprising news from Albania. Albania had always been sure to keep their distance from Yugoslavia, afraid that they wouldn't quite fit in a nation, purpose-built for Christian southern Slavs. But now, with Illyria's new Roman heritage, the Albanians sent Tito an offer that simply couldn't be refused. They would accept integration into the empire, and all they wanted in return was for Titus to build a lot of bunkers in his new province. Titus was obviously happy to oblige, 
And soon, the Albanian dream, every man a bunker, was realized as Albania's backyards, garages and houses were increasingly replaced with bunkers. This plan killed two birds with one stone. It solved the issue of Albanian defense while also ending the Albanian housing crisis. In memory of this great societal accomplishment, Emperor Titus officially renamed the Albanian people to the Mole Men and Albania to the Mound. These Albanian bunkers would later ensure that after the great fire of World War III, only the Albanians and their descendants would survive to repopulate the earth. But we are getting ahead of ourselves, the great fire of Titus is still generations away. By now, Titus already had an extremely impressive record with its economic and territorial expansions, but in the coming decades, he would take it further than anyone could have imagined. October of 1956 would see an uprising in Hungary attempt to remove Hungary from the Soviet sphere, which would soon request aid from the United Provinces of Illyria, whom they considered a beacon of cultural and economic prosperity in the Balkan. This would lead to Titus sending peacekeeping forces to Budapest to save the Hungarians from the coming Soviet onslaught. The Illyrians and the Soviets had an intense standoff and it looked like a full-scale war may just erupt over the issue. Luckily, a series of unlikely events, later dubbed the Corn Affair, would prevent a devastating war over Hungary. Khrushchev, the new leader of the Soviet Union, called for Titus to stand down, threatening that his forces might not stop at Budapest should he not. This threat would spark the West to intervene, suggesting instead that the Soviet Union should step down and resolve the issue diplomatically, as the US even threatened to extend NATO membership to Illyria. Khrushchev's wife, seeing this declaration on the TV, called for her husband to come downstairs to see this broadcast. It was in this most crucial moment that Khrushchev's love of corn would be his undoing. In a sprint down the stairs, Khrushchev would meet his demise as he slipped on the corn cup that he left from last night's midnight snack. This fall would be his permanent demise as his neck snapped, killing him instantly, leaving his body in what later historians could only describe as a funny family guy death pose. The KGB, not believing their leader capable of such stupidity, squarely blamed the CIA, almost igniting a nuclear war between the two superpowers. Luckily, the CIA and KGB managed to hash out a deal that prevented war from breaking out. The KGB would be allowed to assassinate President Eisenhower in return. The Reds trained American national Lee Harvey Oswald to do the job. August 17th, 1957 would be the day as Eisenhower was in Dallas, Texas for no particular reason. This would be Lee's time to strike. He positioned himself perfectly, waiting for the CIA signal to take Eisenhower down. Upon receiving this signal, the shot, heard around the world, flew towards the former general. But Oswald had made one crucial mistake. He had aimed for the president's head, completely forgetting that this man, experienced from World War II, was a total badass. Eisenhower caught the bullet with his teeth, sped it back into his own handgun, aimed and shot Oswald, and all of this in a time span of three seconds. Tired and hungry from this affair, Eisenhower stopped at a recently opened fast food joint, McDonald's. Call it the thrill of combat and adrenaline, call it momentary insanity, but Eisenhower was so impressed by the burger that he ate there, he would crown the two McDonald's brothers the Burger Kings of America, as the US became better known as the Empire of the Golden Arches. After this humiliation, the Soviet Union retreated from Hungary to focus on internal issues, while Khrushchev's wife would seize power in the Soviet Union. Traumatized by the death of her husband, she would prove incapable of a successful rule, instead focusing on developing the Soviet Union's corn production as much as possible in honor of her late husband. This Soviet chaos, combined with Illyrian meddling, would see Romania breaking off from the Eastern Bloc. The new Illyrian-aligned governments in Hungary and Romania, fearing a renewed invasion from the Soviet Union, sent a proposal to Titus asking to be incorporated as the new provinces of Pannonia and Dacia. Meanwhile the Turks, who had up to this point remained neutral, decided to start some trouble. They saw the weakened Greeks as an easy target and after two months of brutal warfare, the Free Socialist Democratic People's Republic of the United Hellas was established as a Turkish puppet regime. Unfortunately for the Turks, it would not be this simple. From their own Greek puppet, the Illyrians begin barreling down the Greek mainland, supposedly to protect the Greeks from the Turks. 
After their victory, Greece too was integrated into the Roman Federation and Titus set his sights east, to Thrace and the city of Constantinople, as Titus knew that seizing the second Rome would further legitimize his claim to be the Roman Emperor. Titus knew that he needn't worry about American intervention. The Roman Empire had always been open to the business of McDonald's and after all, the Americans had been busy themselves. An elderly German migrant to Colombia with a questionable mustache known only by his adoptive name, not Adolf Hitler, had established himself as a drug lord in and later president of a nearly created Colombian Reich, flooding the American market with drugs and forcing decades of guerrilla wars in Latin America. To further build up justification for this invasion, Titus began to propagandize his Roman Empire and the nationalism that came with it even more as he set up Roman restoration parties across Europe with a special focus on Turkey. From here, Titus launched a full-scale invasion of the nation, though his legions would eventually get stuck. From here, bombing raids on Turkish cities didn't drop bombs, but Roman propaganda leaflets slowly winning the hearts of the Turkish people. Eventually, the Romans would surround the old capital, and shortly after, Titus would ride in on a white horse in the first triumph since the age of Justinian, as Titus proclaimed himself restorer of the world, moving the new capital to Constantinople, and soon all of Anatolia would fall to the Romans, as Rome is now truly reborn. With this great success, pro-Roman parties begin having mass success in Italy and Iberia, aligning themselves with the Roman Empire, as Malta and Cyprus joined the empire as well, upon independence from the British. With this, the fall of 1453 had been avenged, but Rome's eternal enemies still remained. The Arabs and the Persians, though they prefer the name Iranians nowadays. Scared by the fate that befell the Turks, pan-Arabic ideals began playing up significantly, with calls for military unification under a strong leader. This would lead to the formation of the Arab League, led by Muammar Gaddafi as supreme military commander. As a first move, this newly unified Arab state overran Israel to better connect the two halves of the Arabian state. But this would soon prove to be a mistake, as Titus declared outrage over this invasion, declaring war on the Arabians. The Italians and Iberians would join Titus in this noble war, leading to a swift invasion of Iberia from the Arabians, as they were pushed all the way up to Madrid. At this most crucial moment, Generalissimo Franco would manage to turn the tides, pushing the Arabians out of Iberia again. After this invasion, Franco would join the Roman Empire as well, becoming the empire's top general. Now under command of a significant amount of Roman forces, Franco led an invasion of Tunis, where the two great generals, Gaddafi and Franco, would meet in person with hopes of solving the war diplomatically, but it was all for nothing. After two months of conflict, Franco would achieve another victory, being awarded the epithet Africanus, as he continued to seize more and more of North Africa. Over in the east, Titus II had begun to march into the Levant, as Gaddafi realized that the situation was very dire. In hopes of forcing the Romans to stop marching on either front, he launched an invasion of the Italian peninsula, marching on the eternal city itself, Rome. This would lead Italy to also integrate into the Roman Empire, under the condition that Titus prevents Rome from falling. It would be Franco who went to defend Italy, as Titus kept pushing forwards towards Arabia. In a town nearby Rome, Franco and Gaddafi would once again meet up, the two generals expressing their great respect for each other, drinking and talking throughout the night, before saying their goodbyes and departing for final combat. The siege of Rome would become an absolutely brutal year-long siege, but eventually the death of Gaddafi would laud the collapse of the Italian front. With Titus' army having reached the Sinai, splitting the Arab world, the Arab League would completely collapse. Most of the former Arab League would be integrated into the Roman Empire, while Arabia and Israel were reformed as Roman puppets with religious autonomy, gaining Titus another title, the Messiah. The Iranians would use this opportunity to invade Iraq, resulting in Iraq's leader, Saddam Hussein, asking the Romans for aid. Titus knew that he couldn't pass up on an opportunity to fight the Persians, that's like the number one Roman tradition, but he also had no appetite to put his people through even more years of desperate fighting through the Iranian highlands. As such, Titus had a plan to end the war without even needing to sacrifice any Romans. 
Because ever since the Turkish war, the Romans had been working on their own weapons of mass destruction and these had now reached completion. In order to have plausible deniability, Titus moved these weapons to Saddam's Iraq, giving the go-ahead for a complete nuclear strike on Iran. Most of Persia's cities were destroyed in an instant as Iraq moved into Persia with Lord Protector Hussein becoming a Roman puppet. This nuclear exchange would cause global tensions to explode as the three global systems, McDonaldism under the United States, corn-based communism under the Soviet Union and Titus's third way were clashing more and more. All three sides had nuclear weapons and any serious conflict could mean the end of the world. Still, Titus just couldn't shake a permanent dream he had every single night, where he would restore the provinces of Gallia, Germania and Britannia and truly complete the restoration of the empire. The Soviets, meanwhile, had mostly given up on geopolitics, instead turning their sphere into a real-life version of Cookie Clicker, working solely on building up corn production as much as possible, no matter how high the cost and how low the reward. The US, on the other hand, had spent decades scouring the jungles of Latin America in search of not Adolf Hitler. After decades of warfare and no sighting of the drug lord for five years, the US had supposed him dead. In actuality, he had once again fled, this time to Australia, under the brilliant new name Not Not Adolf Hitler, charming his way into becoming the Australian Prime Minister. His reign of terror would finally come to an end when he was eaten by a shark during his morning swim with the shark allegedly being a Mossad agent. But unfortunately, the time had come for the old princeps, and on the 21st of April 1980, Titus II, Augustus Caesar, the Great Restorer, the Messiah, the Hammer of Rome, or simply the Great, finally passed away. Many, even outside of the empire, mourned the death of this great leader, as he had brought about a new era of peace and prosperity to his new empire. But without a man capable of filling the large shoes that he had left behind, what would become known as the legacy of Titus saw revolts occur across the empire, with the bloodiest civil war in history evolving into a full-scale world war as the Americans and Soviet intervened. As not all Roman nuclear weapons were accounted for, some were falling into the wrong hands, and in what would become known as the Great Fire of Titus, the old world would be completely destroyed. The only exception being the mole men, the Albanians, ready to repopulate the earth from their bunker-ridden homeland. But that's it for this video. This blessed timeline and many visuals from this video were born in the mind of a madman from my Discord server, sometimes known as Chef. Be sure to check the Discord out from the description below. And that's where I'll end this video. Thank you all for watching, consider leaving a like and a comment to support the content, subscribe for usually two videos every single week, and to continue watching, click on one of the two videos on screen now. Again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.